Okay, uh, welcome to the launch in the Caribbean of the Global Education Monitoring Report, Latin America and the Caribbean Inclusion and Education All Means All. The aim of this event is to discuss how we can advance inclusive education in the Caribbean with key actors from the region, including groups from CARICOM, ministries of education from the region, representatives from the academia and the civil society. We are pleased to count with a very distinguished panel today and the three directors of the organizations which produced the GEMLAC report, Dr. Mano Santoninis, Director of the Global Monitoring Report, Dr. Javier Gonzalez, Director of SUMA and Affiliate Professor at the University of Cambridge, Claudio Uribe Salazar, Director of the Regional Bureau for Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, Oreal Unesco Santiago, Sadia Sanchez Vegas, Director of UNESCO Cluster Office for the Caribbean, Dr. Lorette Bristol, Program Manager at CARICOM, Dr. Marcellus Taylor, Director of Education at the Ministry of Education of Bahamas, Ms. Michelle Bradway, Project Coordinator at the Ministry of Education, Human Resource Development, Information and Religious Affairs in Grenada, Ms. Aera Brown, Support to the Sector Director at Education and Science of the Ministry of Education, Science, Culture and Sports in Curaçao, Dr. Canute Thompson, PhD, Head of the Caribbean Center for Educational Planning and Senior Lecturer, Educational Policy Planning and Leadership, Dr. Anisha Gail Skedes, Social Policy, Program Development, Monitoring and Evaluation Practitioner and author of the 2020 GEM Report in Latin America and the Caribbean. Allow me to introduce now Claudia Uribe Salazar, Director of the Regional Bureau for Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, Oreal Unesco Santiago, and Saria Sanchez Vegas, Director of UNESCO Cluster Office for the Caribbean, who will give the opening remarks. Uh, thank you, Soledad, and good morning to those of you connecting from Latin America and the Caribbean, and good afternoon for those connecting from Paris and other parts of the world. On behalf of the Regional Bureau for Education in Latin America and the Caribbean, Oriol Cunesco Santiago, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this launch event in the Caribbean of the 2020 GEM Report, Latin America and the Caribbean, Inclusion in Education, All Means All. We appreciate the presence of all of you today and especially the participation of the panelists invited to the discussion. This regional report is a result of a collaborative work between the GEM report team, the Oriol Cunesco Santiago team and SUMA. This joint effort enabled us to publish a synthesis of lessons from the local, national, regional and global levels and the identification of challenges and effective practices that promote not only learning achievement, but also equity and inclusion in the education system. Inclusion in this context is understood as a process consisting of actions that embrace diversity, build a sense of belonging, and that are rooted in the belief that every person has value and potential and should be respected regardless of background, ability, or identity. Through several case studies from the region, the report provides in-depth analysis on challenges to inclusion in education arising, for instance, from migration and displacement in Colombia and Costa Rica, from remoteness in Brazil and Suriname, from issues of disability in Cuba and Nicaragua, issues of gender in Peru and Jamaica, sexual orientation and gender identity and expression in Chile and Mexico, poverty in Dominican Republic and Honduras, ethnicity in Bolivia and Ecuador, and incarceration in El Salvador and Uruguay. The research addressed the challenges and experiences of inclusion in education from the point of view of legal and policy frameworks governance and financing, curriculum and teaching materials, teachers, learning environments, and the contributions of communities, parents, and students. This report monitors the educational progress of the Sustainable Development Goal 4 
within the framework of the 2030 Agenda for Sustainable Development, which aims to ensure inclusive and equitable quality education and to promote lifelong learning opportunities for all by 2030. In this framework, the report shows the most significant challenges and key solutions to achieve greater inclusion in education in a region with the greatest socioeconomic inequalities in the world, inequalities that are reflected and reproduced in the education systems. Although Latin America and Caribbean countries have come a long way towards healing past injustice and inequities, important efforts are still needed in order to achieve the Agenda 2030 commitments. This quest has become urgent as the COVID-19 pandemic risks entrenching inequality even more, showing us more than ever the relevance of moving towards inclusive systems. However, the crisis derived from the pandemic also gives us the opportunity to rethink education, its purpose, its meaning, and what we would like to provide every student who passes through, the, through our classrooms. Among the lessons that COVID-19 has left us is that we cannot simply return to what we used to do, as we are currently challenged by the need to critically analyze policies cultures and practices in the field of education and transform them to achieve educational justice. This report collects and presents information that can help us rethink our education system. The report shows that in our region, identity, background and ability dictate many of the opportunities that children and young people will have during their education trajectories. Exclusion often occurs within the school, making teachers, school ethos, and pedagogical practices key elements of the solution for building a more inclusive approach. However, this problem will not be addressed only with technical solutions. Stigma, stereotypes, and discrimination also affect the opportunity to learn. The mindset and mechanisms that generate discrimination and rejection in education participation and experience are the same for all those who are excluded, whether due to disability, to gender, to age, location, poverty, ethnicity, and many others. Every society need, needs to own up to the mechanisms within it that exclude people, which is also the premise on which this report is based. Ultimately, this report seeks to contribute with updated empirical evidence to the development of education policies that are guided by the principles of social justice in the region. Our core objective is to support all those working on education to ensure that the children and youth of all Latin American and Caribbean countries can flourish and develop within systems that recognize the value and richness of diversity for more just and sustainable societies. To help enable this, the report provides policymakers with 10 recommendations that take into account the deep roots of barriers and the wide scope of issues related to inclusion with, which threaten the region's chances of achieving the 2030 targets. This is why through this event, we would like to engage the Caribbean small island developing, developing states in informed policy dialogue on inclusion in education. To achieve this goal, there will be a presentation of the key findings and recommendations of the report for the English and Dutch speaking Caribbean countries, followed by a panel discussion with key actors in the region who are working to promote inclusion in education. I would like to end my intervention by, by saying that on behalf of our office, we look forward to facilitating this regional debate and dialogue on inclusion and education. Thank you very much. And now I give the floor to my colleague, Sadia Sanchez, Director and Representative of UNESCO Cluster Office for the Caribbean. Sadia, over to you. Thank you very much, Claudia. Thank you very much. Good morning, uh, distinguished panelists, colleagues, and participants. Good afternoon. I am delighted 
to welcome all of you to the Caribbean launch of the 2020 Global Education Monitoring Report Latin American Inclusion and Education All Means All. Our intention is to complement the launch of the report for Latin America in November 2020, hosted by the UNESCO Regional Bureau for Education for Latin America and the Caribbean, for which we had the privilege of partaking in that momentous event that highlighted the efforts and achievements of the region in advancing inclusive education for all uh, learners. Nelson Mandela referenced education as the most powerful weapon which you can use to change the world. Rooted in this statement is the belief that education is a vehicle for human transformation, economic and environmental sustainability. Education is the building block of productive and prosperous societies by which essential human values such as respect, equality and dignity can be promoted in order to create and sustain peaceful, peaceful societies. Above all, education, quality education, is a fundamental human right. This was further asserted in the message by UNESCO, uh, apologies, in the message by UNESCO Secretary General, uh, by not the United Nations Secretary General Antonio Guterres, on the International Day of Education, January 24, the SG reinforced that we need education to reduce inequalities and improve health. We need education to achieve gender equality and eliminate child marriage. We need education to protect our planet's resources. And we need education to fight hate speech, xenophobia, and intolerance, and to nurture global citizenship. Indeed, these are key values that resonate with the work of UNESCO, the heart of the Sustainable Development Goal 4, ensuring that every learner is given access to this powerful weapon, as stated by, as stated by Mr. Mandela, to create global citizens, build a strong economies, improve health, and protect our planet resources, as we just said. It is for this reason that UNESCO, as UN lead agency on quality education, commands the Caribbean small island developing states for the systematic and persistent strides made in ensuring that education with focus on primary and secondary engagement in many countries and territories, this has been further extended to strengthening early childhood education, removing the barriers to higher learning and safeguarding equal access to quality education for learners with special and varied needs. We further acknowledge that the Caribbean, like many territories around the world, is also facing new and emerging challenges that require a rethinking, as Claudia Uribe mentioned it, rethinking and for the, for the risk coping of what really constitutes including inclusive education in response to other variables impacting the region. One endemic factor is the vulnerability of the Caribbean small island developing states to the increasing effects of climate change, for which this region has been experiencing significant shift in the frequency and intensity of extreme weather events. These changes in the region's climatic conditions are anticipated to adversely affect a number of its key resources, economic sectors, and eventually the life, livelihood of many, many people in Caribbean seas. Additionally, additionally, Latin American and Caribbean countries have become recipients of large scale mass force displacement in recent years with over 5 million Venezuelans displaced as a result of massive economic implosion and political tensions. Whereas more, most countries in the region have made elementary and secondary education available to these children and young men and women, regardless, regardless of their legal status, the public education systems 
of these affected countries are facing widespread capacity challenges, such as school overcrowding, resource limitations, and language barriers. For these children and youth, the right to quality education might be at risk. As it is known, current COVID-19 pandemic has posed significant implications for inclusive education for inclusive education. Nearly 12 million learners in 29 Caribbean countries have been impacted, causing massive disruptions to education and further complicating the learning outcomes of the most vulnerable and marginalized. A vulnerability further compounded by the projected shocks to the socioeconomic conditions and capacity of these territory of the territories. This, among other factors, must be given priority and fully interrogated to comprehensively advance inclusive education in the Caribbean. This is a complex task that requires multi-stakeholder coalitions and deliberate actions on the part of government, ministers of education, civil society, private sector, and development partners. In the context of the pandemic, it is imperative to invest in education systems to get back on track towards achieving sustainable development goal for by 2030. UNESCO praises the ministers of education in the Caribbean for actively implementing measures to mitigate the educational impact of COVID-19, as well as other obstacles to inclusive education. This includes the distribution of digital devices and other source materials, in addition to strengthening teacher capacities and parental support for distance education, for which UNESCO and other development partners have provided support and technical advice. These are indeed tremendous achievement towards ensuring that no one, no child, no learner is left behind. The Caribbean, like any like other territories, is now given an unusual opportunity to, to engage other strategies to reinforce inclusion in the region in the region, particularly for the most vulnerable. According to preliminary findings in a recent recent study prepared by the United Nations Economic Commission for Latin America and the Caribbean, ECLAC, these strategies include a greater trust for legislation to be put in place to address the needs of the most vulnerable learners, including, including students with disabilities and persons displaced by environment or socioeconomic factors. Strengthening the education mechanism to expand capacity and resource infrastructure, infrastructure to identify and address the needs of the vulnerable and marginalized, analyze institutional and social barriers to access and quality learning by engaging multiple stakeholders, participation and decision making for transforming education, especially th those who are excluded, are excluded. Nothing about us without us. Today, we are pleased to be joined by an excellent panel of experts from Latin America and the Caribbean as we further embrace the principles and advance the practice of inclusive education. We congratulate the Global Education Monitoring Team for your great work in the production of this comprehensive knowledge product and anticipate that this will be a pivotal instrument in paving the way forward for inclusive education in the Caribbean. Thank you. Thank you for your participation and we look forward for an enriching engagement. Thanks for your kind attention. Thank you, Director. Uh, it's been a privilege to count with this enlightening opening remarks from the directors of Real UNESCO Santiago and the UNESCO Cluster Office for the Caribbean. Allow me to introduce now Raul Chacon, Director of the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange Regional Hub led by SUMA and the OACS, Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, who will present the work of this initiative in Latin America and the Caribbean. Raúl, are you there? Good morning, everyone. Can you hear me?
Soledad, can you hear me? Perfect. Great. Good morning, everyone. Thank you all for being here with us uh, and to UNESCO and SUMA's team for organizing this event. Today, we have a unique opportunity to discuss the findings of the Global Education Monitoring Report and specifically the challenges for achieving an inclusive education and social justice in Latin America and the Caribbean. In uncertain times provoked by the pandemic, we reinforce the priority of ensuring education for all. And all means all, it couldn't be a more precise title. Briefly, I will introduce to you the Knowledge and Innovation Exchange Initiative, KICS, promoted by the Global Partnership for Education, GPE, and the International Development Research Center from Canada, IDRC, to contribute to the development of national education systems through the mobilization of knowledge and innovation and learning exchange. KICS is currently implemented in the region by SUMA, Laboratory of Education Research and Innovation and the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, OECS. Working together with country representatives from Dominica, Grenada, Guyana, Haiti, Honduras, Nicaragua, St. Lucia and St. Vincent and Grenadines, KICS seeks to be a contribution to the continuous improvement in the regional education systems. In the KICS Hub, we highlight the importance of using the results of the research, such as those presented in the GEM report, and from here to mobilize evidence and meaningful experiences to inform decision-making processes in our countries. Of course, these findings are related in different forms to the current priorities declared by the countries. Those challenges have been identified in, in issues such as teacher professional development, on the impacts of COVID in the systems, and the common challenge of strengthening the public education systems. The three objectives um, of KICS are the following. First, to identify the gaps, challenges, and priorities of the countries to set the policy agenda for the hub. Second, to synthesize and mobilize knowledge and evidence responding to the country's priorities. And third, to strengthen the regional network through the implementation of capacity building activities for key actors and institutions. In a few words, I will, I will show the kicks like theory of action and change. It situates the country representatives at, at the center of the hub. Then there are three pillars responding to the objectives, setting the policy agenda, knowledge mobilization and exchange and capacity building. We have planned different kinds of initiatives for the period 2020-23, such as systematization, production and mobilization of knowledge and research, elaboration of policy briefs, systematic reviews, webinars and conferences, the development of virtual platforms, workshops and internships and so on. Finally, it's important to mention that the KICS program is also an ecosystem of policymakers, researchers, and practitioners implementing and scaling up innovation. And this is happening currently in different regions around the world. How are all these initiatives being implemented here in Latin America and the Caribbean? The, the KICS Hub has established the following structure of governance. We have an executive team formed by the OECS and SUMA with researchers, education, and knowledge management specialists. At the same time, the Hub has an advisory board of well-known experts who provide a strategic guidance to address the, the priorities defined by the countries. Uh, these are our board members, Joseph Alman from Flaxo, Michael Fulham from the New Pedagogist for Deep Learning, Javier Gonzalez from SUMA, Didacus Jules from the OECS Commission, Silvia Schmelkes from the Ibero-American Ibero University of Mexico, Emiliana Vegas from Brookings Institutions, and Joel Warrican from the University of West Indies. Finally, at the core of the governance are its protagonists, educational leaders of each country, representing different perspectives, public officers from ministries of education and leaders from research centers and universities, civil society organizations and teachers unions a great diversity to foster quality education in our region. Last but not, but not least, I want to remark some of the main principles of KICS. 
We understand education as a human right, fostering the role of evidence in decision making. We assume a bottom-up approach to define the priorities, engaging a broad base of educational stakeholders. And we, build in, and we are building relationships based on trust, recognizing each one's strengths and positive experiences and trajectories, and considering them as a starting point to face our challenges. Thank you very much for your attention. We look forward for collaborating and learning together with all of you and the different institutions you represent today. Thank you, Raul. I remind our audience that you can use the Q&A function here in Zoom in case you have any questions. And please to introduce now Manos Antonini, Director of the Global Education Monitoring Report who will present the key findings of the GEM Lab Report 2020 for the Caribbean. Thank you, Soledad, and thank you everyone for coming to, uh, today to this event, especially the panelists, that uh, we really uh, appreciate their readiness to speak to the various issues. My role is to um, provoke a few thoughts about uh, how inclusion was described in the introductory speeches and covered very well uh, by both Claudia and Sadia and uh, essentially put a framework for the questions and the interventions that are going to follow. So I will, um, first of all, uh, share my screen. And um, a reminder for those of you who may not be familiar with the Global Education Monitoring Report, this is uh, the tool of the international community to monitor progress on education in the Sustainable Development Goals. And it was, um, 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 first of all, uh, given a mandate in 2015 uh, to do that uh, and basically to do two things, to monitor SDG4 in particular, its quantitative indicators, but also uh, to monitor the implementation of national and international education strategies to achieve SDG4. And the theme of inclusion is, of course, critical because um, inclusion is mentioned in the very uh, formulation of SDG4. And I should say, that this report uh, was, uh, as you heard, jointly uh, done. Uh, first time that we had a partnership for uh, one of our products, such a uh, in-depth partnership with the UNESCO Regional Office in Santiago and in Suma. Um, but in many ways, it has been a partnership with uh, many more of you, and I will come and explain that uh, later. As I mentioned, the key challenge is, and that's the key message that I want to convey to you, is what really inclusion means. It's true uh, that uh, the, um, the theme of the, the concept of inclusion has been around for a while, but it has been closely associated with the issue of disability and special education needs. And it is thanks to the communities that supported this particular idea that we um, came to understand inclusion primarily, because it was thanks to them and the uh, Article 24 in the UN Convention on um, the rights of persons with disabilities, that Article 24 really focuses on the rights to inclusive education. But immediately after that, uh, the UN Committee that uh, helps interpret uh, the, the convention set out on a process that took another 10 years before uh, they issued General Comment 4 uh, in 2016, a key moment which acknowledges that uh, education and inclusive education cannot be associated just with one group because as you heard from Claudia the mechanisms that exclude one group are more or less the same mechanisms that exclude other disadvantaged populations and therefore we need to take a much broader view uh, but when the international community uh, um, came together and agreed in 2015 uh, on SDG4 and the commitment to inclusive and, uh, and uh, um, equitable education of good quality for all uh, this uh, art, the general common for had not even yet been issued. And I think the purpose of this report is precisely to remind everyone that essentially the right to inclusive education is a right to quality education for all. And every country has to make progress, as was already mentioned earlier. The Caribbean has large education inequalities. And I'm going to refer to just a few. The secondary school completion rate, universal secondary school completion, is indeed uh, an objective for uh, SDG4. It's one of several. Uh, the re region is, is doing well in that respect. However, 
uh, there are also large inequalities remaining and we should not look just at averages. The gap between the poorest and the richest uh, in, um, uh, in, in the region can be very, very high. You see uh, some examples, 1% uh, of the poorest, but 39% of the richest complete secondary school in Haiti. 19% uh, of the poorest and 74% uh, in Belize and Guyana. Uh, boys and girls uh, have also large uh, uh, gaps. Two points in Jamaica, six points in Barbados, 16 points in St. Lucia. Large issues there about disengagement of boys in the Caribbean. Among 20, 12 to 17 year olds, uh, adolescents, those with disabilities were 10 percentage points less likely to attend school in Trinidad and Tobago. In Suriname, with the little information that we start now having trickling in on learning outcomes, only half of uh, children aged 7 to 14 could read with comprehension, but there was a 22 point gap between the urban areas and the interior, but also between different ethnicities. And with that, um, uh, we have to remind ourselves that we don't have enough data in the Caribbean, and that's a key message of the report. Um, we have been using increasingly around the world household surveys that are publicly available uh, to allow us to disaggregate education indicators. But in the Caribbean, only four out of 21 countries had made such a data uh, source available in public. And in, with respect to learning outcomes, it is also the case that very few participate in cross-national learning assessment uh, that can help us understand a little bit better um, where we are and what we need to do. Six countries do not collect data on children with disabilities. However, there are some positive steps uh, in, in the way we understand and, and measure disability so that it uh, is a definition that is more consistent with a social model, not with a medical model. And a, a group of uh, the Washington group has set out questions also uh, in partnership with UNICEF, the child functioning module. And these questions will increasingly be used and we hope to see them more used uh, in the Caribbean as well. But let us not forget that it's not just a matter of quantitative indicators. Systems need to also monitor the experiences, the sense of belonging, not just the, the results of, of learning and, and attendance. And that is a concept that needs to permeate um, uh, the information systems in the Caribbean. Of course, we have seen the crisis of COVID-19. These inequalities, we're concerned that are going to increase further. Um, we know that since February, schools have been closed for 30% of days on average and partially open for 20% of days, um, that these percentages are even higher if we take out uh, schools, uh, the days for, for which schools had academic breaks. So learning loss, poverty, and interruption of various support services are going to affect the marginalized more. And that means we need to be prepared. As you heard, the regional report um, was based on a series of case studies uh, that, uh, that covered eight different characteristics, but was also based on a series of uh, country profiles uh, that document how every country in the region, in fact, in the world, uh, has been uh, addressing laws and policies on inclusion in education. And we are grateful uh, to CARICOM for their support uh, and to uh, OECS as well, uh, helping link us with uh, the responsible officers in the different ministries, but also the uh, sub-regional cluster that was particularly instrumental for that. All the resources are available on the peer website, uh, educationprofiles.org, uh, where you can actually uh, find comparative information on every country. And let me now come to the key messages. As you heard before, it is extremely important to widen the understanding of inclusive education so that it's not associated just with the concept of special needs. In the region, unfortunately, 32% of, country, of countries have a definition of inclusive education, and of those, only 29% cover multiple groups. So there is a big conceptual difference between how, where the world is moving and how the Caribbean countries are uh, addressing the uh, concept of inclusion. So we're basically, we're talking about one in 10 countries taking that broader perspective. Countries have been making an effort, and I will document those. Barbados, for instance, in its, uh, in its plan, talks of uh, inclusion as a fight against the discrimination and stigma based on a broad range of, of uh, factors, including gender, religion, and disability. So but one, one uh, good example of why countries need to do more about uh, inclusion 
coming back to disability is that still laws in the majority, in the vast majority of them, uh, determine that children with disability should be educated in separate schools. And this sets the Caribbean apart from other parts of the world, which have been moving much more in, with stronger intent in the concept of inclusion uh, and mainstreaming, making sure that all children can attend their local school. Jamaica has made progress and the policy paper, the, the background paper that um, um, you will hear uh, more about later, um, does uh, mention that uh, children with disabilities can access both mainstream and special schools. And special schools can adapt the curriculum based on individual student profiles. But the, in the absence of national guidelines, a consistent approach of how these adaptations are happening cannot be ensured. Trinidad and Tobago has launched its inclusive uh, school projects just uh, last year uh, in 21 schools in, across the seven districts. Uh, and it really tries to um, take this broader perspective, ensuring that all schools cater for all students, regardless of uh, their needs, often in partnership with NGOs and bringing in special schools. Financing is, of course, important. The region needs to spend more on education. You see here the two. Uh, global indicators on the percentage of education finance, financing as a percentage of GDP and as a percentage of the uh, national uh, budget. Uh, you see that uh, many countries actually miss both benchmarks, um, despite the fact that some, uh, like uh, Belize and uh, Montserrat, are actually uh, among those countries in the world that spend most in terms of education, uh, in terms of GDP. But what is very important is that targeted programs need to also become more, more widespread. There are some examples, cash transfers in Jamaica, for instance, target boys that are further behind. Um, Trinidad and Tobago has extra financial support for students with disabilities, but these need to be brought into a wider framework. And because the objective is to bring all students to mainstream schools, to local schools, uh, given the tradition of separated provision and uh, the fact that some resources are concentrated in a few special schools, it is very important to share. Uh, that calls for governments to uh, promote horizontal collaboration between all ministries to develop integrated programs, vertical collaboration with different tiers of government to provide the support and the capacity they need, not just the funding, but also flexibility in the use of resources. There are some interesting examples. Um, regional special needs coordinators in Jamaica support the process. In Belize, there are itinerant resource officers, uh, but more uh, needs to be done in that respect. Universal design is a concept that uh, is used a lot with reference to inclusive education. It refers usually to the idea of building uh, school buildings that have, uh, are accessible for all. It has been applied more broadly to also mean um, uh, uh, curricula and uh, um, approaches to learning that fit the needs of every student. In the report, we uh, apply this concept more broadly uh, to uh, refer to flexibility in the curriculum. Uh, there are different challenges in different countries, and some countries have some of these challenges in common. In Anguilla, like in other small island states, um, there are increasing um, flows of uh, immigrants from other countries uh, who do not speak English. So initiatives for uh, the growing Spanish-speaking community, for instance, to support English as a second language exist in primary, but not in secondary education. Uh, in Suriname, which has declared itself as a, a multi-ethnic country, there has been an effort to bring uh, the other the 14 languages uh, spoken in the country, um, but the multilingual lessons are still offered in a relatively limited basis for half an hour per week to familiarize perhaps children with the, the, uh, the, the richness of the country, but not enough to use uh, the different languages as mediums of instruction. Um, in Jamaica, alternative pathways have been offered uh, once the second education system expanded, uh, offering tailored instruction uh, to um, help some of the lagging students uh, falling behind, but they're not accessible and available to all schools, which does uh, has a risk of perpetuating uh, potentially different st strands of education and different speeds. Guyana has practiced for many years radio instruction, which has been really instrumental for um, learning in um, remote uh, areas um, in the interior. But there are always, uh, and of course, it was very, very handy and very important uh, in the COVID crisis. But uh, there are always uh, concerns about whether the, the quality of instruction is at the same level as that received by students in other parts of the country. And in Haiti, fewer than 10% of people with impairment have actually access to the crucial assistive technologies that they need. 
if I could say perhaps the most important message for achieving inclusion in education is that all teachers should be prepared to teach all students. There's a tendency around the world, not only in, in, in the Caribbean, to treat education, uh, inclusive education as a specialist topic. An example is in the Bahamas, where the disability law calls on special education to be compulsory uh, in teacher training. But that's perhaps not the best way forward, because every teacher should be prepared to teach every uh, child that they have may have in the classroom. Teachers all over the world have their biases and its skills to be able to overcome them. I've mentioned some example here uh, in many Caribbean countries uh, where uh, secondary education is being universalized. There was a tendency to think of uh, student behavior in particular ways, but as more disadvantaged students have come into the system, there is a, a risk that teachers may look down on those uh, students who may be uh, low performing. Uh, an example where teachers have been more flexible is in Belize, where um, there is some bias among teachers who may look down on, on those uh, students who may be speaking with a dialect. However, there's also a lot of appreciation and efforts to incorporate and make sure that language mixing and code switching is used in the classroom. It's a very important source of uh, showing how committed they are to inclusion. Teachers in many parts of this region are ill-equipped to intervene uh, to stop bullying related to sexual orientation, gender identity and expression, a very sensitive topic. And of course, as we strive to make sure that all areas of a country are served, it's very important to provide incentives. Suriname provides incentives for teacher to, uh, teachers to work in remote interior areas, but the effectiveness of, of those uh, incentives is still at, under uh, examination. Finally, uh, it is very important to think of inclusion as a community uh, matter. And of course, communities may have conflicting views and different perspectives on how to achieve uh, that uh, objective, because it's a matter of shared social uh, understanding. Uh, where boys lag behind, some countries enhance segregation by setting up single sex classrooms, thinking that this is the best solution. Others are uh, more uh, cohesion oriented, developing gender based manuals uh, to promote the, the case for uh, equal performance for both boys and girls. Many poor students, and that's an aspect, another aspect of uh, gender equality and inclusion, are caught by false notions of what it means to do hard work, whether it is a, a feminine uh, um, trait that they should not be complying with. They are pressured to join gangs, causing a lot of problems in the school community, uh, also by the need to earn uh, and support their families. Boys who end up, who are still in school, end up stigmatized and potentially excluded. And that's a major challenge for Caribbean education systems that an approach to inclusive education should definitely prioritize. The, the issue of Venezuelan children in uh, many countries, uh, Aruba, for instance, uh, has 15% of its population now consisting of uh, Venezuelan migrants and refugees. Um, not all countries um, have included them in the national education system, which uh, is really uh, a must, as our 2019 report said. Uh, but other governments have also helped, uh, sought help and support from NGOs. Uh, in Guyana, for instance, NGOs support the government uh, to run community-based English teaching uh, to help the, uh, the inclusion of these children into the education system. But it's very important that these efforts are actually uh, subscribing to the same objectives that the government set so that there is alignment and, and common sense of purpose. Um, last, uh, it is very important to learn from each other and I'm really grateful for all of you uh, for, for joining today. Um, maybe some of these issues are provocative, uh, but it's important to discuss them. It's important to give the opportunity to reflect on them. Uh, as I said, uh, PEER, our education profile site, provides uh, one basis for such discussion, uh, seeing how other countries have addressed these issues through their laws and policies, maybe not through their implementation, but it's a first step. And also uh, do uh, access our um, online monitoring uh, um, resources on education inequalities uh, wide a database, which is now run jointly with the UNESCO Institute for Statistics and scope an interactive visualization of key SDG4 data that tell you a story about the world uh, and how far it is from its um, uh, common objectives to 2030. Thank you very much once again for coming. Uh, do remember where you can find all these resources, the background papers, the video that hopefully you can uh, hear uh, at your ease later because it's a nice video. Um, and uh, all sorts of uh, animations, infographics that you might want to use for your advocacy for inclusion in education in the Caribbean. Thank you again.
Thank you, Manos. I want to tell our audience that this meeting is being recorded and it will be available in our social media channels afterwards. Now we'll have a segment of discussion with the high level panelists who joined us today. Dr. Javier Gonzalez, Director of SUMA and Affiliate Professor at the University of Cambridge will moderate this segment. Javier. Thank you very much um, and welcome to all. We're really very excited um, for this uh, joint report that we have uh, elaborated with uh, UNESCO Orealc, uh, UNESCO GEM team and, and SUMA. Um, we're especially excited because of its topic that has to be with um, inequality and inclusion. Uh, a topic that of course is very relevant for our region as we all know. Uh, the most unequal region in the world. And although we know and, and we have seen um, what, what inequality means, especially now in, in, in COVID, uh, uh, in terms of, for example, income in the in terms of the income divide, uh, sometimes our national statistics and our international um, uh, figures are not able to really collect information on more invisibilized groups, such as uh, the ones that are included, especially in this um, GEM report. Uh, so we think this report makes a special contribution uh, to better understanding both, of course, the lack of information that we still have on these groups, but uh, counting on the few uh, studies and research that, that we have collected and that we uh, promoted also with 29 studies in 19 countries uh, that are basically underlying this, this report, plus more secondary information, of course. We think that we're making a contribution to better understand this, uh, how can we may be more, a much more inclusive society. And inclusion understood in, in not only in, in, in terms of recognizing, but also in terms of valuing uh, and much more important in building upon diversity. So uh, we really believe we have to move forward in this sense. We want to open this space then uh, to, to really have a conversation, an open, open conversation with uh, country representatives and uh, very high level panelists um, from education uh, ministries of, of the Caribbean and multilateral organizations from the from the region. Uh, I would like to introduce then uh, our, our very uh, high level panelists, as I say, uh, Dr. Lauret Bristol. She's a program management uh, manager at CARICOM. Uh, Miss uh, Michelle uh, Brathwaite. I hope I pronounce properly. Please excuse me if I, if I don't get it exactly right. Uh, she's the project coordinator at the Ministry of Education, and the Human Resource Development, Information and Religious Affairs of Grenada. Dr. Marcellus Taylor, Director of Education of the Ministry of Education of Bahamas. Uh, Dr. Anisha Gales Gidis, or Gales, um, Social Policy Program Development, uh, Monitoring and Evaluation Practitioner in a contributor to the 2020 GEM report of Latin America and the Caribbean. And finally, uh, Dr. Kanye Thompson, um, he's a head of the Caribbean Center of Educational Planning and senior lecturer uh, of education policy planning and leadership. So I would like to invite all of them if they um, can put their cameras on. I see most of them. Yeah, they were all there, yeah. And, um, and then to open then the, the floor for some questions. So the, the rules of, of, of this uh, segment basically for to give and provide opportunity to all of the panelists to properly address the question uh, is to have five minutes for to answer. So I, 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 I thank you in advance to, to try to limit yourself to those five minutes. So let me start by, by saying that the GEM report, uh, the 2020 uh, Latin American GEM report, recognizes, of course, the existence of several 
barriers um, that hinder uh, students in, ter in terms of their capacity to reach quality education. One of these barriers has to do with rurality and remoteness. Uh, these are indeed uh, and remain, of course, one of the key barriers to uh, inclusive education, uh, of course, in the Caribbean, but across the world. Uh, the, and it's important to say, of course, that the current pandemic has exposed the difficulties of reaching most marginalized groups uh, even more. So the COVID has highlighted the digital divide. We were all talking about the era of digital technology, the era of knowledge, and the pandemic has showed us that we're, we're not ready yet for that era, definitely. And the divide, the economic divide, which Manos was just uh, mentioning before, uh, is very important. So the lack of sufficient infrastructure and the urgent need for teaching models adapted to, the, to, to this modality is something that we see that is very important. So in that, uh, in that context, I would like to, to ask Dr. Marcellus Taylor, as I said, Director of Education of the Ministry of Education of Bahamas, uh, what actions has the Bahamas taken to ensure that learners in rural and remote areas especially have access to quality education? Uh, and, and what are the maybe the main challenges this COVID-19 pandemic has added to this, this uh, to reaching this group? Thank you, uh, Dr. Taylor. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Moderator, for uh, your question. And also I'd like to thank uh, the organizers of this event for including the Bahamas in this dialogue. Um, first, let me just provide some um, contextual uh, information just so that everybody could um, have a better understanding of what rural means in the Bahamian context. The Bahamas itself, as many other Caribbean countries, has a very small population, 400,000 uh, uh, people. But in the case of the Bahamas, what is uh, a bit uh, different is that it, the Bahamas is not one landmass. And so we have many communities spread over many islands. And so this means that many of our, um, uh, or not many of our people, but a, a good many of our islands still have to be serviced, even though they are far flung and also uh, the, in, uh, the populations are small. Um, to give you an example of, 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 of this, more than half of our public schools have enrollments of fewer than 100 students. And none of these uh, schools are resident in the um, capital um, of uh, Nassau on the island of New Providence. And so it means that we have had to, over the years, dispatch teachers and whatever resources we can to many communities where we're duplicating and replicating services for small uh, populations. Um, our country has been committed to that. Our country has been committed to um, inclusion and we actually call those islands that are not in the capital area, the family island because we, we want to, even just in the rhetoric, demonstrate that we are in, in including them in what we do. But on the ground, it, it manifests itself in terms of education in a particular way. So we tend to have the small schools in each community. The schools are not as well resourced as they ought to be. With teachers, of course, um, you might have the right number of teachers, but uh, you know, the student per teacher ratio might be the right number. But when you think of the fact that they have to teach across the curriculum and also across grade levels, so multi-grade teaching and um, is the norm of the day. And also if anything were to happen in some instance to a teacher, if that teacher is ill, if it's a one teacher school, that means that the school is closed down for an extended period of time. And so um, this is the backdrop of the context of our rural schools. It's not as if you can jump into a car and drive on the other side of the island to service the rural school. And so attracting, especially young teachers to those areas is very difficult. And I have a particular interest in these rural schools as I commenced my uh, career in education working in rural schools. I worked in four rural schools before I um, moved to the um, uh, capital city. And so um, from a first-hand experience, I know how difficult it is to really provide quality education as an instructor, 
you want to do the best for your students. But if you were trained in one uh, area, uh, for instance, in my case, I was trained as a social studies teacher, but you still have to teach the mathematics, you still have to teach science, you still have to teach all these subjects. And while you do your best, your best is perhaps not the same as if it were uh, provided by someone who were trained in that area. So what the Bahamas has done uh, recently is systematically try to address this, um, these challenges around providing quality education to the rural schools. Um, the first um, main effort is around the distance education effort. And for years we have been talking about distance education and how we could get it done. But over the last four or five years, there has been a lot of work with upgrading the um, internet um, services to these family islands. And so it's now possible to, um, throughout the family islands, connect people via the internet. And the Ministry of Education itself has gone on to try to connect all of its schools with high-speed internet services. And in areas where we cannot have the fiber optic cable coming into the schools, we are using um, uh, a mobile technology to connect to the internet. And so um, making schools internet ready is one step that has been uh, used. That has been developed to an extent where by 2019, the Ministry of Education was able to establish what we call the virtual school. And this was before the pandemic, this was before Hurricane Dorian. That virtual school was geared towards being able to provide students in schools with fewer than 50 students in the secondary part of school with an access to education across the curriculum. So instead of only being able to sit four or five examination subjects, students are now able to sit 10 to 12 examination subjects because of this virtual school. And it works basically by um, amalgamating the students across schools in these small communities to make up a grade level. So if you are a grade seven student, you may have in your class students from different mm -hmm. islands across the Bahamas being taught by one teacher who teaches that subject to you the whole year. It's a live interactive process. And so um, it's, it's, it's the best we can get to having that direct instruction face-to-face. -face. Also, um, we have, um, since Harkin Dorian, been able to provide devices to every single student in these rural areas. And so we have um, uh, launched a program and we have completed that exercise of providing them all with devices so that even if they are not able to come to the school, they are still able to access this learning. And also finally, um, because of time, we have um, engaged in a process of school amalgamations. And so in some communities, you know, we had uh, a number of schools on an island, but those schools had very small enrollments, 10 or 15 students. And what we have done is we have amalgamated them so that we could take the few resources that we do have and maximize them to the benefit of the students. And finally, in 2016, the ministry implemented a homeschooling program, which also provides persons who live in the rural communities the option to engage in homeschooling, self-schooling themselves, where they can take advantage of any curriculum that might be accessible to them and um, offer that as instruction to their students. So thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Dr. Taylor, um, it's very interesting to, to see the efforts being done by the government of Bahamas, which of course is not uh, easy in terms of how, uh, how you, as, as you have mentioned, uh, due to the scattered population and then small size of schools. Um, so I guess definitely, I, I think it's quite innovative what, what, what you're doing and the efforts that you're doing in terms of of upgrading internet and the other programs, programs you have mentioned. I would like to, to invite uh, Ms. Michelle uh, Braithwaite, uh, who is the project coordinator of the Ministry of Education in Grenada, in regards to children with disabilities. Uh, we know they are among the most marginalized learners and uh, our report found that many of these children actually continue to be uh, educated in separate settings, despite, of course, 
the suggestions and the evidence of uh, the need for more integration. Uh, and we know also they often lack the support uh, they need to actually succeed in education. So in this context, I would like to ask what is Grenada and the, of course the location of Grenada doing to promote uh, the inclusion of children with disabilities uh, in education? Thank you very much. Thank you very much uh, to the chairman and good day to all who would have joined um, this morning. Grenada is definitely on the road to inclusive education. And as we know, inclusion is a process. If we look in terms of our legislation, our Education Act 2002, which speaks to inclusive practices, that of our chief education officer providing special education program for every student uh, that would require such. <laughs> Grenada has ratified also the Convention for the Rights of Persons with Disabilities, as well as uh, the Convention for the Rights of the Child. We also have as our mandate uh, for the provision of that of education for all. And recently, our National Sustainable Plan, the National Sustainable Plan of Grenada 2035 hinges on the 17 Sustainable Development Goals. One of the outcomes, that of a resilient, inclusive, gender sensitive and peaceful society is that of the outcome number three. Our core values as well of the National Sustainable Plan for 2035 speaks to social justice, fairness, it speaks to equality and equity as well. It also addresses gen gender disparities in education and ensure that of equal access to all levels of education and even that of vocational training. There's also going to be a review, a review of our national curricula and also the ethos of our, of our, of our schools, the culture that is within our school. So a national sustainable plan speaks to that as well. And the upgrading and maintaining of our educational facilities so that they are more child friendly and more inclusive, um, as well as disability and gender sensitive in providing what we would call safe schools, um, inclusive schools if, and effective learning environments for all of, of our students. Now, what would have worked well for us in Grenada? We can now safely say that our inclusive education policy is at the stage for acceptance uh, by the cabinet. And we know that our inclusive policy, everything it will be the umbrella body for our code of practices. And we're at the stage of submission to the cabinet. Within Grenada, yes, we do have three special schools, but all students with sensory impairments, such as visually impaired and hearing impaired, or which we prefer to call blind or deaf, are integrated and in some cases included in the mainstream setting. I say integrated because yes, some of the provision may not be there for them, whereas there are those who are included within the mainstream schools. So students who are deaf and students who are blind are no more within special schools, but are within mainstream schools and they are supported by 15 itinerant teachers for the deaf and the blind. We also have about 75 of these students with a population we know in Grenada of just about 100,000 persons. We also can boast of having devices, assistive devices pres presently for our students. There are brailers, there are embossers. Our students now have e-learning devices that would have been provided by corporate partners as well as the Ministry of Education. And also we have um, partnered with Starkey Hearing Foundation where all of our students with hearing loss are fitted with hearing aids. In terms of the model, that of the social model to that of the medical model. Grenada is more looking at the social model to inclusion. So we're not looking at the labeling and identifying who is autistic or who is 
LD, but we are looking at building on the strengths and weaknesses of our students. We are more looking at changing the mindset of our community, the mindset of our teachers, the mindset of, of our policy makers, and not trying to fix the disability of that child. So we have adopted more or less the social model to inclusion. The government of Grenada has invested in 17 teachers who are presently receiving their first degree in special education and they, in special education, inclusive education, so that they would be able to provide that support for students within the mainstream schools. It is not for special schools, but they would be fitted into the mainstream schools to provide um, support as well. Sign language, because of COVID, we had sign language through a program, as you know, Grenada is the island of spice. And because of that, we had a program and it is still actually running on our television, uh, as well as on social media called Spy Signs, where we did not want during the COVID period, the start of the COVID, COVID period, as we know, for the deaf community, their mother tongue is sign language. So we did not want that they would have lost that language. So we continued providing the support of sign language to our students through social media and television. And it was also a way of having parents learn sign language, having other students within their class who engage day to day with them learn sign language. So this program was sponsored by a corporate um, partner and we continue to show this daily in Grenada. When we think about pedagogy, we think about our teacher education training. Presently at our TA Marisho Community College where our teachers receive um, teacher education training, it is compulsory that inclusive education is part of the course. And this course is being taught by competent persons trained in inclusive education. We have what we would call a very strong, robust support, um, especially for the visually impaired and the deaf persons in Grenada. We also have um, support for our vulnerable students through the SEED program support for empowerment and development program. The school feeding program as well is provided for our vulnerable students, as well as we have a counselor assigned for our special needs students in Grenada. When we speak about vocational training, presently a project which focuses on having children with special needs within the project. In order for this project to be rolled out, it must entail boys and girls with special needs. We also have, through the social development um, unit, roving caregivers, which is which more or less that program is geared at stimulating our children, stimulating uh, children as well as parents before they actually get into school. Presently, our students have access. Our students have access to regional and national exams just as any other child. Before we know that education was provided um, before for a particular sector, a particular group of persons in society or a particular strata, but no, education is free. It's available for every child in Grenada. We had where uh, a cohort of 20 persons would have had the opportunity, opportunity through a training in inclusive education. This was um, in collaboration with Roehampton University, the Ministry of Education Grenada and the Ministry of Education Seychelles. This uh, was a pre-module um, accredited course in inclusive education, which was rolled out here in Grenada and is available for anyone in the Caribbean who would wish to um, provide such modules on inclusive education uh, to their students, to their teachers, sorry. Also within the Ministry of Education, we do have a special education unit. We have special education officers and um, a, a, a speech therapist as well. However, in spite of all what is happening for inclusion, there are challenges. And I will quickly try to see just a few of them to mention a few of them. For example, we do have attitudinal barriers 
within the culture, we still have a bit of, of bullying, the way um, persons may see persons with disabilities, uh, in terms of even school leaders, as well as educators. So with um, having an inclusive policy, we know that we will be able to now combat the problems of these attitudinal barriers. There are socioeconomic barriers as well, which exist. There are organizational barriers in terms of now we are addressing that of our policies, in terms of having more qualified persons to work in the area of inclusive education is another barrier. And I must mention that of gender-based barrier. There are issues of sexual ab abuse or neglect as well for persons or children with disabilities. So we have recognized that there is a need for more of a multidisciplinary sort of a program which addresses the gender issues and disabilities. So it is not born only by the Ministry of Education, but it is seen as something for both the social um, sector as well as the health sector uh, to be involved in inclusive practices or inclusive ed education to become a reality. It is the Ministry of Education's drive to develop inclusive culture. It is our desire to have that whole school approach, community involvement, to be involved more in inclusive policies, because if we are then able to change the inclusive culture, then we will have more inclusive policies, which will then lead to inclusive practices within our institutions or within our schools in Grenada. So our drive and our, our pathway will be that of a whole school approach to inclusion. And we have made consideration in terms of fighting discrimination against children with disabilities. We are looking at that of dismantling the socioeconomic and other barriers that exist for inclusion it is within our policy. We are looking in terms of ensuring that relevant national stand standards are aligned to that of the international standards which support the implementation of inclusive education. We believe all means all, and it is our focus to make sure that no child is left behind and we provide quality education for all. Thank you. Thank you very much for this very interesting um, synthesis of the problems that you're being that, that we're being we're facing in the region, uh, and 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 how countries are actually uh, managing with these problems. We will move forward now with uh, in regards to intercultural education in a way, uh, and for this I would like to 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 invite. Uh, Ms. Uh, Ms. Brown, uh, sh she's a support to the sector director at Education and Science uh, of the Ministry of Education, uh, Science and Culture and Sport in Curaçao. Uh, one of the main issues, as we say uh, in the report, is not only in terms of recognizing, but also valuing, and most important, building upon diversity. Uh, and therefore, one of the key barriers to inclusion in education uh, has to do with language. In the case of, of, uh, of Curaçao, we see that in Dutch speaking countries across the Caribbean, um, the language of instruction, it's a key barrier. Our report shows that not all groups are represented in the curricula and the challenges of teaching children in their home language has yet to be effectively addressed could you please then, Ms. Brown, uh, could you please tell us a little bit more and maybe highlight some of the good practices that okay. Chris is promoting yes, to overcome uh, these challenges? Thank you. Thank you for the question. Also on my behalf, a good morning or afternoon and a word of thanks for including us in this dialogue. In order to answer the question, I will share the following information with you. 
Our native language is in the law for official language is considered as an official language and its instruction language. A concept law for an advisory board for language policy will be offered to the minister next week. The priority task is to give advice on all aspects of language policy and education and to effectively address home language in education. Our native home language is standardized, has its own spelling, dictionary and so on. School boards have the option of using the mother tongue as the instructional language in primary schools. Our primary schools pupils are allowed to take the final test in their, um, the final math test in their native language papiamento. Educational gap policy is also a tool that schools can use to eliminate gaps among indiv individual students. Um, Curacao is in the process of establishing an academy for Papiamento. The format is in draft for discussion. And soon an entity will be established that will be responsible for developing methods in Papiamento and Dutch as a foreign language. Um, at school levels, many individual teachers go the extra mile by developing materials themselves to support the learning process. And they also use um, the use of remedial teaching for individual students or smaller groups is also being um, used. That, that, that was my answer on your question. I hope it was clear to you. Thank you very much. Um, I would like to, to now change from countries to international organizations, which are regional, such as CARICOM, and, and ask uh, Dr. Lauren Bristol. She's a program manager uh, at CARICOM. And, and of course, uh, these regional organization, organizations such as CARICOM play definitely a key role in strengthening education systems in the region. And they promote, of course, the advance of inclusive education. Could you please then highlight some of the key actions that CARICOM is promoting to strengthen this uh, inclusive education? Thank you. Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you, Javier. I want to say on behalf of the CARICOM Secretariat how grateful we are for this opportunity to actually highlight some of the challenges and opportunities, and I, I must say as well, some strengths that exist within the Caribbean region. And we know that we still have a fair way to go in terms of ensuring that we truly develop inclusive societies. And we understand in a very deep way that inclusion is a way of being while we understand inclusivity or being inclusive as a practice. And therefore, when we think about advancing an inclusive education system as a practice, Practice, we require three things. So the, these three things are the, the ways in which the work of the Secretariat is actually uh, revolving around these three, three issues. We recognize cultural and behavioral change is needed and our previous colleagues have spoken to that. And therefore we recognize the importance of supporting teachers and communities towards uh, shifting radically in the mindset towards inclusion. We recognize the need for shifts in discourse through the implementation where they don't exist, the legislative and policy imperatives. And of course, we also recognize the need to upgrade and modify spaces for learning and places for learning. Uh, and in the last 12 months, we recognize and appreciate deeply <coughs> sorry, that we also now need to think about homes among these educational places and spaces. So what are some of the key actions that the CARICOM Secretariat through the work of the Human Resource Development uh, Work Program, we have been focused on advancing a culture and strengthening quality educational delivery, particularly privileging education for inclusion and inclusive education. In the immediacy of the COVID-19 impact, we have recognized the need to 
radically upskill and support our teachers and educational stakeholders. So we have actually been collaborating very closely with our partners. And of course, there are mandates coming down through the course of itself that requires now an increased emphasis on advocacy for identifying gaps, seeking to close those gaps and positioning educational data as a means of advocacy particularly around increasing educational financing. And I know that we have seen already that within the Caribbean region that many of us actually are in the top in terms of education financing, but we want to be much more strategic and therefore we are advocating strongly for our member states to be strategizing about how to use that financing more efficiently and more effectively. And therefore there is a key role to be played by the CARICOM Regional Network of Planning Officers as part of that mechanism for monitoring and evaluation and results-based management. We are working uh, with our partners to sustain and increase energies behind strategies for the CARICOM Human Resource Development 2030 strategy. And of course, many of us would be familiar with that strategy and know that it is closely aligned to the SDGs. So some of the specific activities related to that is a focus on teacher training, not just in terms of the use of technology, but in terms of that cultural mindset that we're talking about, that shift towards that paradigm shift that is needed around inclusion and inclusive education and therefore towards that the CARICOM uh, standards for the teaching profession for classroom teachers, educational leaders and teacher educators uh, has a strong focus on promoting inclusive learning environments and inclusive classrooms where all means all as we engage and we recognize the ecosystem. So we are not focusing only on teachers, but we actually focused on educational leaders as well because they have a role to play in ensuring inclusive schools through the ways in which they interact with them, their teachers and their community themselves. And of course, through teacher education, not just at the point of the cur curriculum modification for teacher training and preparation, but teacher educators themselves within tertiary education sites and contexts, also promoting and modeling that inclusive school culture. And that work, of course, is happening regionally and nationally as member states are adopting and adapting and developing or revising their particular standards for the teaching profession. Significant work is taking place and, go, and on the way around the development of the Caribbean New School model. We talked about behavioral change, we talked about shifting discourses around policy and legislature and the Caribbean New School model provides those guidelines for developing what we might call those ideal spaces for learning that is much more inclusive. And of course, thinking about the ways in which those spaces need to be modified to uh, provide access for the different types of learners that we have within our environment and recognizing that there is no one uh, fixed way for a school to be designed because schools also need to provide cultural relevancy and therefore schools in different locations would have des different design models. So that work is on the way now and we are hoping to be able to produce that work and share with our member states uh, before the end of the year, everything being equal. Uh, the basic education quality management framework, another significant strategy that we are engaged in, because part of quality and part of understanding how far we are being inclusive is about putting those quality management measures in place within systems. So we are working at the level of the secretariat to develop a framework for that quality management system, commonly called an inspectorate, but the research that we have done um, to date has indicated that there is strong resistance to the notion of inspectorate and that's for another con conversation where we talk about the ways in which words uh, connotate certain kinds of images then allow people to receive uh, information in a particular way so we're doing that work ar around what is the best way in which we speak to the whole question of quality management systems so that it doesn't suggest uh, or return us to colonial um, memories of force of top-down management etc so that work is also on the way to guide teaching and learning of course there is an increased focus on the sectors of skills for lifelong learning and the tertiary education sector, recognizing that these sectors feed the workforce. And we know the data, the data is out there. We understand that if you are not engaged economically, 
you will be excluded. So recognizing the importance of focusing on those sectors that feed our workforce to ensure that we increase economic capacity and capability uh, as a way of systematically reducing those areas of exclusion because of socioeconomic impacts. Overall, with regards to the work and policy development that we're doing, there is a mandate at the CARICOM Secretariat for all policies, uh, practices, procedures, guidelines to be gender sensitive and offering critical sp perspectives for strategies for education for all as we go forward together. Again, I will take this opportunity to thank Jem in particular for paying close attention to the work of the Caribbean. We know we still have a way to go, but uh, this is an opportunity for us to coalesce around and locate where we are in the region as we continue to progress forward. Thank you very much, everybody. Thank you, Dr. Bristol. You're indeed very engaged and committed to, to working with different institutions uh, in, in, in the promotion of this inclusive system. So thank you very much for your, for your words and comments. I would like to, to just address another quickly. It has to do with the human and subjective biases that we all have. And that's sometimes, I would ask if, uh, yeah, everybody puts their mic off. So uh, again, uh, that, that has to do with, with social biases. Uh, of course, we are all subject to, to this very um, intrinsic subjective biases that we have uh, according to the society that we live in. And sometimes these are actually a barrier uh, to promote a culture of inclusiveness in schools. Um, in fact, well, the report uh, argues that inclusive education involves ensuring that teachers basically are able to and prepared to teach all students. Um, inclusive teaching requires teachers to recognize every student experience and abilities and be open to this diversity. However, of course, we know that teachers are not immune to social biases. These conceptions about the potential of learning capacity of different students. And this, of course, is a, quite a, a, an issue. We know just to put a, an example, we know in the region and, and it's in the report that for those countries that we have data, uh, more than 60% of LGBTI children are bullied in their schools. When we ask students uh, who are they be being bullied by, and I mean bullied because of, the, of being a LGTBI, uh, what we find is that actually most of this um, psychological violence or language, symbolic language, comes from teachers themselves. Uh, so it's not uh, a children's game, it's something that it's being, promoted by teachers themselves, sometimes very unconsciously, of course, by through the language that they use, the metaphors that they uh, uh, use in, in, in their own teaching. So training programs need to focus on tackling these entrenched views of some students as deficient and unable to learn or as inadequate for the school system or for society. Uh, they are finally, teachers are finally the ultimate responsible uh, actor for instilling an inclusive school culture and ethos. So in this uh, context, uh, as I say, I would like to invite Dr. Thompson. Uh, I, as I mentioned before, Dr. Thompson is head of the Caribbean Center for Educational Planning and senior lecturer in education policy, planning, and leadership. So uh, our question for this debate would be, well, how are Caribbean countries actually facing these challenges in teaching and head teacher education uh, in terms of, as I was saying, in terms of the removing, working around these biases that, so that we can become a much more inclusive society. Thank you, Mr. Uh, Dr. Thompson. 
Thank you, Mr. Chair, and uh, good morning to everyone. I know it is evening and afternoon where some of us are. Um, I want to just begin by making the observation that inclusivity um, doesn't happen, it has to be planned. And one of the things that the Caribbean Center for Education Planning has done is to uh, develop a framework that engages or makes provision for the engagement of a wide range of stakeholders in the planning process at both the institutional and the national level. Um, perhaps the earlier point I should make is that very often the focus of inclusion uh, tends to be on what takes place within the specific confines of the teaching and learning engagement and not sufficiently with respect to what I would call the, the planning of the educational delivery package. And so one of the things that the Caribbean Center has done in its work with um, schools in the development of their strategic plans is to promote a stronger, more vigorous embrace of multi-stakeholder inclusion in the planning process. And so if you, if you were to attend um, any of our planning sessions, the audience you'd see would consist of, in addition to staff members from academic, ancillary, and administrative um, categories, we would see members of the community um, or particularly um, taxi drivers, vendors, uh, and other persons who do business with the school, uh, in addition to parents, teachers, and PTA and board members. And we do this because of the often, uh, the mistaken assumption that persons who are either unlettered or untrained do not have much to contribute to the planning process. Um, the curious connection is that very often these um, otherwise um, not so uh, educationally lettered persons have a deeper understanding of some of the, the tender underbelly issues of, of, of exclusion and are aware of some of the, the, the children in the school community who are facing, um, are experiencing difficulties which put them at risk to exclusion. So the first issue that I want to raise around this issue of inclusion and how we prepare our teachers and our principals to lead the process of planning is the vital importance of multi-stakeholder uh, involvement in the planning process. The second observation I would want to make um, and to share from our experience has to do um, with some of the issues on which we focus when we begin to engage schools in the planning, in the, in the planning and to identify the potential spots, you, you may want to call it, or blind spots for um, exclusion and to overcome those blind spots to ensure inclusion. At the, at, at the top of the list, I would want to place the issue of class distinctions that are often made um, across the education system broadly, in which it is assumed that some schools are destined to produce um, low performing students based on their location um, geographically, based on their history, and based on the uh, the social classes from which students normally uh, are, students are drawn to attend those schools. There's almost a kind of tolerance that the society has for low performance coming from those schools um, and a kind of low expectation. One of the things around which the, the, the literature on both leadership and inclusion um, is, is robust is that one of the key factors in improving student performance is, is a culture of high expectation. And, I, and what we have found and what I'm arguing is that the tendency to uh, not expect much from some students based on their location, um, based on their social class, 
is one of the biggest barriers to inclusion in our education system. And this affects us right across the Caribbean. Um, and the, uh, some of the comments made earlier from some of our, our other colleagues would highlight this. A second area, uh, our second factor which drives uh, exclusion or second barrier to inclusion is what I would call gender biases. And those gender biases in the context of Jamaica and other Caribbean countries are biases which um, manifest themselves in a kind of tolerance for boys' exclusion. Um, so the, if we look, look at the results coming out of, out of the CXC, for example, when, it, when you look at the uh, performance of boys versus girls, Generally speaking, girls are outperforming boys um, by a significant margin. And Dr. Bristol um, would, be, would be quite um, at home with that reality. And my own work on boys' education um, and the problem of exclusion highlights that. So, and, and while there are physiological differences that well, let me put it another way. There are physiological differences which define learning patterns of boys that are different from girls, but sufficient attention is not being paid to those physiological differences. And when we, and what we see now in our schools is that boys are underperforming, and but little attention or insufficient attention is being paid to that fact. And I'm saying that one of the things that we encourage schools to do um, in the areas where we have done work supporting their planning, and one of the sets of uh, conversations we have been having with um, policymakers is the importance of taking account of the uh, physiological, biological differences and to um, reconfigure uh, the curriculum to take account of the ways in which boys learn. Right? There has been a long dialogue on this, but insufficient, insufficient attention has been paid. Of course, there are issues related to um, uh, students with uh, learning disabilities, uh, visual and hearing impairment, but these these are given, uh, these are recognized, even though they're not given a lot of atten attention in or given sufficient attention in our planning. So I want, to, I want to want to end my five minutes by making the point that the two areas that I see requiring greatest attention to overcome the problem of exclusion, or to put positively, to improve the level of inclusion is to, um, to increase our intolerance um, and, 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 and decrease our satisfaction with um, underperformance because of some of our students' class, uh, social class um, affiliations or so social class um, markers and to impose on ourselves a commitment to place high expectations on students, and secondly, to do much more than we're doing um, with respect to uh, boys' education, or education that targets our boys. I think my five minutes are up, so I'll stop Thank there. Thank you very much, Dr. Thompson. That's perfect timing. and. And I think this is a very important topic, the issue of, of biases, and, and especially when it comes to gender in the case of Caribbean, among other factors. Uh, I will finally uh, would like to, to address the importance of intersectionality in terms of how do we work across in a vertical and horizontal way across government and also between government and other actors in the education system. And for this, I would like to invite uh, Dr. Anisha Gales Geddes. I hope I pronounce it. Please uh, be sure to, to correct me uh, uh, to, so I can really uh, pronounce it correctly. A uh, social analyst and um, she's a background author of the 2020 GEM report for Latin America and the Caribbean. So welcome, uh, Anisha. And, uh, Basically, like as I was saying, inter intersectionality is a key um, to achieve inclusion in education, of course. And the GEM report actually encourages vertical and horizontal co collaboration 
within the, the government and also between different levels and actors uh, in the ecosystem of education so that we can achieve this um, inclusive education. So I would like to, to focus on Jamaica and, and, and ask you what are the main challenges uh, in terms of the intersectoral work in Jamaica uh, regarding especially uh, disability students, students with disability uh, and which good practices maybe we could learn from the work that you're actually doing in Jamaica. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Um, good afternoon to everyone where, where, where I am is evening. Um, it's a pleasure to uh, discuss the importance of intersectionality and the inclusion and meaningful participation of students with disabilities. First of all, I want to say that in the space of recognizing inclusion has to go, that work has to go hand in hand with recognizing that people are different, and in this case, students with disabilities. And I may say that even among the community of this, students with disabilities, there are differences according to type of disability. It could be deafness, it could be a physical or mobility disability, and it could be blindness, visual impairment, or learning disabilities that are more invisible disabilities, uh, like dyslexia and so on. And so it's important to understand that disability may differ according to type. It may also differ according to severity and cross-secting with also the intersection as it were with uh, gender, uh, urban rural location, some of my colleagues would have spoken to. And in the context of small island developed states, you know, Guyana, uh, you would have to travel several, uh, you know, miles to, to get to the interior or could be up to 24 hours if you're going by road versus uh, in the case of Bahamas or, uh, you know, traveling to another island. So it's important to recognize that geography, type of disability, gender, and of course, ethnicity for First Nations people, such as those uh, persons living in uh, perhaps Guyana, Belize, uh, the Commonwealth of Dominica. Um, would differ uh, as well as other factors, including age, uh, as well as poverty status, I believe our colleague just spoke of earlier. So there's a, there's a compounding or knock-on effect of experiencing multiple vulnerabilities. So if you consider a female with a disability living in the interior or rural areas, what does access mean for this person? And so intersectionality has to be forefront of planning processes to include but not limited to recognition in legislation, ensuring that such is enshrined so that the multiple layers of inequality and inequity in terms of access and quality of education becomes a central focus for policymakers and that programming is targeted and responsive to the needs of varied persons with varied types, severity and other uh, overlapping intersections of disability. So I'd like to also identify that beyond uh, the uh, recognition of how disability in intersects with other inequalities and inequity in society, it is important to recognize that there is, there is need for what is called a twin track approach to service provision for students with disabilities. And what do I mean by that? I mean that the agenda for inclusive education that the sustainable development goals articulates mainstreaming and the inclusion in regular teaching and learning environment, students with disabilities must find themselves into that environment rather than specific apartheid or ostracized uh, environment or traditional special needs institutions. And so that mainstreaming process, however, requires that there is disability specific provisioning. So how do we treat with the, the availability of data to know how the needs of students with disabilities may differ according to type, severity, geography, uh, poverty, status, wealth quintile, et cetera. That level of data is needed. And I believe Dr. Bristol spoke earlier to the importance of data. 
how many, how do access, wh what does access looks, look like when we consider assistive aids and technology? So for students who have learning disabilities, and I always say disability, we classify learning disability, it's really not a learning disability, but I might um, cause some anxiety among our educators here, but I consider it as a teaching disability because the pedagogical environment needs to be inclusive in how it delivers, how it accommodates, and how it assesses our students uh, so that all students can learn and that all really and truly means all. I give you one more example, school to work transition. How does that look for students with disabilities? Do you need job coaches? Or do you need career preparation services? Do you need an interlocutor that will speak with employers to ensure that they understand that access and accommodation in the workplace is not a burden? So that when students complete their education, they're able to transition to the labor market, either to find employment or to create employment to be their own entrepreneurs. I think that Jamaica and other countries in the Caribbean do indicate um, the, the some good practices that have been emerging that ties in with what the report calls those horizontal and vertical linkages. And so first I'd like to identify the importance of the state in terms of public services working intimately with community-based organizations to include organizations of and for persons with disabilities. And some ex good examples exist, such as the Combined Disabilities Association in Jamaica and the Guyana Council of Organization for Persons with Disabilities that have worked hand in hand with government agencies to ensure that those deficits that have been identified are, can be plugged to service the needs of students with disabilities from the early childhood level going straight to the tertiary level. I believe that the University of the West Indies, it, the, for example, the campuses at St. Augustine and Jamaica, uh, Mona and St. Augustine rather in Trinidad and Tobago, provide good practice with respect to having office for student services and development that creates a bridge between students and the academic domain to ensure that access becomes real for such students. There are some bright spots in terms of the, the provisioning of uh, you know, having a special education unit in the context of of the Ministry of Education in Jamaica and mainstreaming what is called regional special education coordinators to ensure that services are become more equitable for students with disabilities in rural area. Uh, rural areas. And of course, at, at the teacher training level, uh, countries such as the Bahamas and Jamaica have talked about the importance of compulsory special education uh, being morphed into teacher training. And so I'd like to say that, you know, the importance of horizontal and vertical linkages to be meaningful, to be sustainable, needs to look at those various layers, the legislation, the policy environment, the programming that provides disability specific support services for students with disabilities and working closely with families and community based organizations, including non governmental organizations of and for persons with disabilities allow for a meaningful engagement and delivery of services. I was quite surprised when I did a background paper for Jamaica to find that many persons did not uh, assimilate the implications for the sustainable development goals and all of those various indicators that are disaggregated by disability status and what that means for their programming in terms of costing and the delivery of services. So this joined up approach and integrative attention to intersectionality is, a, is an important part of uh, policy work, it's an important part of legislative work, it's an important part of programming to ensure that we're designing and we're monitoring and evaluating in a meaningful way the outcomes for students with disabilities over time. So I, I end on this point that uh, when results are provided in the Caribbean context, there's often a disaggregation of the quality of outcomes by how many passes are in CSEC, by Caribbean Secondary Education Council examination, uh, by gender. There's the, 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 the disaggregation of the data by sex, rather. And there's no disaggregation of the data by disability. 
and what that means for tracking outcomes over time. And it's the same thing when we look at common entrance exams or what might be called 11 plus exams in Barbados or otherwise. There are several comparative types of examination, but when it comes to the data analysis, dredging, disaggregating, and determining what accounts for uh, lower performance, what can strengthen, improve performance and quality of education, there are significant weaknesses. And so the intersecting work of disability will need to, in an integrated space, treat with these and other uh, related factors. Thank you. Thank you so much, um, Anisha, for your words. And, and I think that's a, the points you make are, are perfect for, for me providing some kind of closing remarks uh, for this fantastic uh, journey that we have had <laughs> today in terms of different topics that we have been able to navigate and to really learn, at, at least I speak, I speak for myself, in terms of uh, the, the, the different policies and challenges that we see are um, present today in the Caribbean. Uh, just to close the session, because I'm aware of the time, uh, I think I just would, would like to just say that I think COVID times have provided two main lessons, uh, probably among many others, but, but I think two are, are, are worth noting. One has to do with the fact of the collective that goes beyond the individual. I think we have recovered in a quite concrete manner the fact that uh, basically we can we don't live in a in in isolation we share a planet uh, we share uh, well an environment uh, health issues educational issues economic uh, dimensions etc so uh, the the importance of the collective is very very important i think we have learned about this and and therefore the fact that we're not alone means that we have common problems, but also that we have common solutions uh, that we can promote. And that's for me the second, uh, basi basically the second lesson that very neatly comes from the COVID uh, pandemic is the fact that we need to really be able to consolidate both multilater multilateral and international frameworks for cooperation, uh, which have been weakened in the last uh, decade, mostly, uh, very strongly, uh, and by some world leaders. And within that also, to be able to strengthen the state, as of course, at the national level, as the entity, as the actor, of course, as well, working with the rest of the community, the, the civil society, private sector, but it's the state which of course has to be much more strengthened in order to be able to promote the common good in this collective. Uh, there's no other way because what is an option for the private sector, it's a mandate for the public sector. And we have the mandate to promote uh, this um, right to education. So we know we know uh, further uh, uh, do I would like to 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 finish uh, and, and close this this seminar just by saying that for both uh, for Suma and UNESCO, uh, both at the regional level in the UNESCO Santiago and UNESCO Paris and Gem team, it's an honor really, and, and I think we're very happy to to be able to provide. Uh, this report to have a space of discussion with you, with all the countries, uh, hear um, your challenges, learn from what you are doing, uh, and, and therefore we're really, really very happy with this. We hope that the report sheds some light, is able to shed some light on, the, on some of these challenges. Uh, as Anisha just mentioned, the issue of data Still, of course, it's an issue and we have to make much more effort on that. Uh, of course, the, this work does not end here. Both UNESCO and SUMA are very committed uh, in engaging and working with the different organizations in the Caribbean and, and also specifically uh, uh, SUMA, the, the institution that I lead, uh, we're very keen to keep on working. We're actually working beyond research as well 
on a KICS initiative, which has been presented today, uh, which is an initiative working with eight countries in the Caribbean and Central America, uh, working with the ministries of education, civil actors, teacher unions, defining challenges and therefore agenda, an agenda that is, that is not being set or defined from abroad. It is being defined by the countries, for the countries. Uh, and that's very important for us. Uh, and we're facilitating ASUMA and OECS, we're facilitating this process uh, of agenda setting. The second fact that we will be uh, doing as well from the kicks as Raul Chacon, the director of this initiative was mentioning is uh, promoting the mobilization of evidence. So evidence is not for it to stand in a library, evidence is for, to, it's for it to be used. And, and it has to be mobilized for you for in order to, to inform policy making. And therefore, the thir third issue, as we were saying, is basically um, the capacity to provide spaces of exchange and capacity building. So we will be working together with your governments, with OECS, with SUMA, and I'm sure in many ways as well with UNESCO uh, in, uh, in this KICS project, which, which tries to move into concrete actions uh, in, uh, to, in, in order to promote this inclusive education. Thank you. Thank you very much for being here. Um, and I'm sure we'll be seeing you very soon. Thank you very much.